Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the first episode in a new series that I'm going to be doing which I guess I'm going to call something like Game Engine Concepts. So this is going to be purely conceptual, no code, but I'm going to give a high enough overview that you guys can hopefully take these concepts and implement them in, in your own game engines. So there's going to be no rhyme or reason to the order I go, but sometimes it's nice just to have an overall conceptual view of how to do specific things in a game engine. So specifically what we're going to be covering in this tutorial is font rendering. And I'm going to be doing classic font rendering which involves using a texture atlas. And people may think this is slow. If you were like me, I thought that this would be the slowest way to do this. But this is actually the accepted way to do this because it's actually the quickest. We'll take a look at the reasons behind that. But how do you do font rendering in a low level render API like OpenGL or DirectX? How does it work? Well. It usually happens in two phases. Uh, phase one, I'm going to call generating the bitmap. And this involves generating the bitmap and all of the character info that you will need in order to display things onto your actual window in the final end result. The second phase I will call just rendering. So this is just using that generated bitmap and character information to generate rendered information that you place on your screen at runtime, at the game's runtime. Uh, this phase would usually happen in the loading phase of like levels or scenes and when you're loading all your other information your assets and everything you would generate your bitmap in there just to save time for when you're at your runtime actually running the game let's take a look at what generating the bitmap involves a little bit so when i say generating a bitmap i'm not only talking about the texture atlas which you should see pictured on the screen right now so this is what we're thinking of when we're thinking of a bitmap is just a texture atlas full of all the characters and the characters that I will be thinking of when I'm thinking of this is the US ASCII character set. But there are other character sets, uh, the UTF-8, the Unicode something format. <laughs> and this is usually used for like Chinese characters, like Mandarin characters, or Greek and Latin letters for accented ASCII characters, uh, for just emojis, lots of different things. But the more characters you want to be able to display, the more you are going to have to load. And that will have a direct result on how long it takes to load your bitmap and how long it takes to load your assets in general. Because if you're trying to generate very large files, it's going to take well. So usually you'll get a subset of the UTF character set. So you'll usually get like, okay, I only want the Mandarin set of characters, which range from here to here. And then that way you don't end up loading the thousands upon thousands of characters that you could end up getting. So once you have the character set chosen that you would like to use, the way you generate the bitmap and get all the info uh, is using the .ttf file. So I'm actually going to go down here. .ttf is the true type font file. And this is a file format, font file format. That's sort of similar. I like to think of it as a .svg. It's like a .svg in that it doesn't contain like a bitmap. It doesn't contain the actual character data, Windows has a .bmp file, which they used to use for fonts. No, this contains mathematical notations to describe how to draw specific letters. So it contains um, something that would tell you, okay, you need to draw a line this way, a line this way, and a line this way, and some mathematical notation, sort of like the Bezier curves in an SVG file. This is preferable because what this means is now you can store in a re relatively small space enough data to get fonts of any size. This will scale as large as you need it. This is also universal. This works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. The .ttf file is a universal. I think it was developed specifically because Mac needed a font file to compete with Windows. But besides that point, you need this TTF file for those definitions, but I don't expect you to look up the file format and generate all uh, your fonts from that because that's kind of a pain in the butt. It's doable. You can do it. I would just suggest using a library. And so if you're going to use a library, uh, the one that I would definitely recommend the most is STB TrueType. So this is Sean Barrett's other library. He's the same author of STB Image. And uh, this gives you a way to basically convert .ttf files to a BM, uh, not a BMP, but a texture. So you could use this and it gives you textured data. So it's not actually in PNG format, but he basically gives you 
just let's look at it actually it says if you look at the header of Sean Barrett's library, it says this library processes true type files. It parses files. It extracts glyph metrics, which are basically the character width for each glyph. It extracts glyph shapes. So that's the shape of the object, right? So that's the um, that's like the mathematical notation defining how the shape is. It also renders the glyphs to one channel bitmaps with anti-aliasing. And that's sort of the important part that we want to focus on because rendering to one channel bitmaps basically means that it renders it to a bunch of data. That's a bunch of numbers, which basically just rem uh, represents pixels being on or off. And we can use those pixels to then create a PNG image, which is our bitmap. Now, there's another library that I will mention for those of you using Java, and that is Java Graphics 2D API. Uh, the Java Graphics, uh, specifically the AWT library, has functions that you can use to also generate font files. So what you would do is you would create an image in Java and then you would use the Ot library to load a font and then you would just draw all your glyphs to that font and then now you have your PNG image that you can just export and then you can use that as you would. So under the hood, I'm guessing that this does something similar to what Sean Barrett does to load in... A, the, the font and then generate the appropriate images. Once you have your library chosen, you will have to look into the documentation, everything to see how to use it to load that TTF file. But what that should give you is all of the things that we want to uh, contain. So first of all, it gives you that PNG image, right? It's not gonna be an actual PNG image. It's gonna be just RGB data. Uh, or specifically one channel data. But it gives you this data and then it also gives you these things, the width and the height of each character. So the height of each character is actually going to be the same because the height of each character is the line height, uh, which basically just means that for each line of text, you're only going to have a certain height and each character will be that height. So uh, you'll usually get the line height and then the width of each character. And the width of each character does change from character to character. So what I usually do is once I get all that information, I create a hash map. So just some hash map representation, which goes from a character to some structure. This structure could just be a small class. This class, I like to put inside of it the width, which is uh, the width of the character. So like 14 pixels. The uh, texture coordinates, X coordinate. So where it is on the texture, you would have a big texture. So say the A starts 0, 0. Then the texture coordinates width, the texture coordinates height. So how big is it on that texture? Like 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And this should give you all the data necessary because now you know how to render it to your screen because you have the pixel width, but you also know how to get the texture width and the texture height um, to pull it off the texture. You have your texture coordinates and stuff, which is important for when you want to go into rendering it. And so that brings me to the second stage, actually rendering your fonts. So doing all that stuff is definitely the harder part. Um, once you get to actually rendering it, it can still be difficult, but it's easier because you're following a bunch of techniques that hopefully you're familiar with by now. And so basically what you do to render it is you generate a bunch of quads for each character that you would like to display, right? And so this is nothing new. This is basic OpenGL DirectX, how you render in general. And so the quads consist of two triangles, which can be indexed. So you can have 0, 1, 2, 3 four, five, six, seven, and you place these quads uh, wherever you want. And then what you do is you literally render them the way you would render any other quad textured quad. You would just use the texture ID from this bitmap. So it has some text ID. And then you would just use the texture coordinates that we talked about. So the texture units Y, the texture units X, and the texture units width and height to use GLSL or whatever shading language you're using to then draw that texture over these quads. Now the hard point in drawing text onto your screen is say you want to render some text right here. What do you do? Well, this is several quads. This isn't one thing. We like to think of it as one thing because it's one string, it's one word in our minds, but in reality it's several quads. And so each quad would look something like this, uh, just wrapped around each character and they would all be the same height, but I can't draw very well. <laughs> and so where do you place these quads in the world or on the screen space? Well, what I like to do is I like to center them according to the center. So the center point is where the position. So if the user says place this string at screen space um, 520 
by 520, then I will place it according to the center. And then what I'll do is I will calculate the overall length of this using that texture info that we stored up. So then in order to do that, you would just say, okay, what's the width of T plus E plus X plus T? You would sum up all those widths, which would give you the overall width. Um, divide that by two and subtract that from the position they give you to get your starting X. Once you have that starting X, what you need to do in order to get the appropriate information is the first letter would be T. So in order to generate this quad, what we have to do is we have to say, so uh, there's our star X, which is SX. So then to get T's information, we would say, okay, so T, uh, the bottom left corner is at start X. And then we would do the Y, which is just whatever Y they chose minus half the line height. So this is just the line height. So we'll call that SY too. So SX, XY represents this bottom left corner. So there we go, we got the bottom left corner. Now to get to this top left corner, what we would do is we would just say, okay, that top left corner is just SX, SY plus line height. And then this top right corner, we would just say is, okay, that's just SX plus the char width. So T's width, which we could get from our lookup information inside of our hash map. And then it would be SY plus line height. And for the last coordinate, it would be SX plus the character width and SY, which would get us this bottom right corner. Now we have our vertex data, right? This is all of our vertices and embedded inside this vertex data, you would also use the texture coordinates X, the texture coordinates Y, because of course this is a textured quad. So you wanna be able to send that texture ID and all the relevant information along with the actual world coordinates. And those are relatively easy to obtain because they're already inside of that hash map. So you have your world pose X and Y, and then you have your texture coordinates UX, UI, which you get from the hash map that we already created. And we have everything. That's all you need to send to the GPU, right? And so using this data, we just send that to the GPU via a shader. And now we have our letter T drawn. <laughs> now you typically want to continue doing that for each character. So if you wanted to render the whole string in one draw call, what you would do is then you would increment SX. So you'd say, okay, SX plus equals uh, the character T's width. And then you would do E next. And then you would finish calculating E and just append all that vertex data into this big array. Then you would say, okay, now X and then do X and then you would append that and then you would do the last T and just so on and so forth. Then you would upload all of that vertex data to your GPU and you would do that via your vertex attributes, just like any other quad. And then you would render it. If you have a batch rendering system, this can get a little bit more complicated because trying to integrate it into your batch rendering can be a little annoying, but if you designed your batch rendering to be generic enough, this shouldn't be too much of an issue to just add in the new texture for your font atlas and to add in these vertex data. And then you don't even have to write a new render, uh, a new shader. You can literally just use the shaders you're already using and it should work just as well. What about rotating the text? So say you wanted some text that was rotated like this. Uh, this is why I said you should use the center point as the center point of everything. So if you actually rotate it, this becomes a lot more complicated and you have to use some math to figure out exactly how this goes. So once again, you would calculate the width. You would get the overall width. Then you would say, okay, this is width minus two. And what I would do is I would get a vector pointing in the direction that you want to rotate it. So the way you would do that is you would start off with a vector, horizontal vector. So this is just zero one and you would rotate that by however many degrees you want to rotate it. So if it was 45, you would rotate it by 45 degrees. That's your vector. Then what I would do is I would say, okay, so the start position, uh, whatever your start position is, that's a vector minus this unit vector, which is we'll call the direction D times half the width. So HW, half the width, which is a scalar. And what this will give you is this will give you this starting point over here. And so then you can use vector addition to continue to calculate just like you would have over here. And you would just go in the direction of your D vector and multiply by whatever the character's width are, and it would get you to the correct places in the end. And calculating all of the vertex data would be the same as it was before. So rotated text is a little bit more complicated. It's still relatively simple, uh, just a little bit more complex math, but it's the same process. Now, once again, doing all this can be complicated. 
So I have links to lots of different articles that should help you along in your journey with this. Now, I will say one thing that this is not good at is if you want to, say, render large fonts. And so the bigger the font gets, uh, the more data you have to calculate, the more taxing it will be on your computer. And so instead of doing that, there's a different technique, which is called signed distance field font rendering. And basically what this is, is it's using a different type of bitmap. And you should be seeing a picture of what that bitmap looks like. This is basically just a bitmap that tells you, okay, if the alpha value is less than 0.5, draw a pixel. And what this allows you to do is scale your fonts to a much bigger value. And since you're using alpha values, they blend as it gets larger. And so then since they blend as they get larger, what ends up happening is you maintain your crisp uh, lettering. And so Valve actually wrote a paper on this way back in like 2001. Uh, still used today because it's a good technique. You can use this. Um, it's complicated. I haven't done it myself yet because I haven't looked into it enough to know how to do it. But once I do, I will release another video describing some methods that you can use to go about this. For now, if you're just now getting into this, I would suggest just sticking with a bitmap, seeing if you can get it working with a bitmap because this will be the easiest way. If you can generate this PNG, then you're home free. That's the hardest part. And then you just need to figure out how to display them in the correct uh, way on your screen space. I will also link one other thing, which is basically <laughs> using the mathematical notation. So using the uh, almost SVG-like formulas. So like using Bayesian curves to basically determine whether or not to draw a pixel. And this actually allows you to get pixel perfect rendering for any size with, I think, less data than this. And because of the way GPUs are made today, this is actually feasible and not only feasible, but it's pretty performant. So it looks great no matter how big the texture gets and it's pretty performant. I'll have a link to some descriptions about that. That's way over my head right now. I can't do it. <laughs> but if you want to take a look at the articles, the articles will be listed there for you to take a look at. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe. And uh, if any of this didn't make sense at all, leave a comment and I may consider doing a more in-depth different type of video. Let me know if this helped too, because talking about it in a high level overview like this is good and it makes sense, but sometimes I feel like it's not enough. So let me know if this helped you guys. Let me know if you're able to implement it based on this explanation and let me know what pieces I'm missing, where I need to go into more depth so that I can improve these for you guys in the future. But that's it for this tutorial, guys. I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.